My parents have always been a huge pain in my butt. And honestly, I don't think they'll ever quit being one either. No matter what I do, or how I do it, they always come back at me with either their disapproving glares, or will actually tell me about how much I'm worthless. Every single moment in my life, they've always had me try and meet standards that honestly weren't even possible for me at my younger age. One good example of this would be my schoolwork. Every time I would come in and get my homework done, either my father or mother would grab at it and put their own version of the problems on a scratch piece of paper and would make me do them. Sometimes there would only be a few of them, but most of the time there would be more than 30 to 40 new questions that they would hammer onto me. More often than not, it would be questions that didn't even pertain to the subject at hand and would be completely random in nature. To add insult to injury, my teacher, Mrs. Baker, would actually grade these separate sheets of work and then praise my parents for having me do extra work. Honestly, that wasn't even the worst of it. I have many more stories of them that make my blood boil every time I think of it. However, none of those stories even match up to the worst thing that they've ever done to me in my life. And that's, they try to dictate my life in every aspect of it. No matter what it was that I did, what kind of clothes I wore, what food I ate, how much money I earned, they would always find ways to try and either suck the fun out of it, or use it to control me in numerous ways. I remember it got so bad that I wasn't even allowed to eat a bagged lunch that I got from the deli within my own home, with my own money. And then when I decided to call them out for that, they sent me to my room with no food for the rest of the day. Yeah, there were a pair of narcissists that made my life an ever-living hell every opportunity that I got that they could get. Of course, like with some people, this narcissism didn't last for too long. I wound up moving out of my house at 18 to go to college. However, unfortunately for me though, they still had different ways of controlling my daily life, even outside of my house, specifically with controlling how much money I'd get each month. And they were the ones, and since they were the ones paying for the college to begin with, no joke, I couldn't really do much of anything. So while I didn't have to face with them, you know, I didn't have to face to them every single day anymore, I was still stuck with their vice grip around my throat. And yet they wonder now why I never talk to them anymore. To lighten up the mood a little bit, after that rather grim startup in my life, I will say that I was at least able to actually choose what I wanted to major in in college, and that specific choice of mine was in animation. Well, specifically animation and sound design for children's shows. No, not the ones meant for toddlers and the like, but more aimed for the 12-17 year old demographic. Honestly, it was an easy task. Actually, no, I'm wrong. It wasn't. But thankfully, my knowledge of that and, and the like of animation really helped me out a lot, and I was actually able to graduate college with a bachelor's degree in animation. However, that's not to say that it wasn't a difficult time for me at college itself. Granted, it's hard for everybody, no doubt about that, but for me, I think it was a little bit worse. In fact, I'd even go so far to say that I was rather lucky, to say the least as I was honestly very close to getting expelled once for an incident that happened during the middle of my fourth semester in college. For a bit of backstory, I had a roommate at that time. A roommate that basically made a year of college, my last year at college, turn into a year-long time of me practically being home with my parents. His name was Deke. Deke was, in my own words, Basically the love child of both my parents mixed in with an added punch of psycho in the mix. He was the kind of person whose narcissism showed in very obvious ways and tainted everything he went near. And to make matters worse, he was one of the most popular guys in college. How? I don't know. It's more or less shocking to me. It was, it was shocking to me when I first found out the first time around that he even had friends to begin with. Now, how exactly was Deke a narcissist? Well, to put it bluntly, he treated me like I was absolute garbage and then played it off as if we were friends, or that I deserved it in some way or another. And any time I would try and call him out, he would start up with guilt trips and how he was going to do a lot of bad things to himself if I ever stopped hanging out with them and being friends with them. 
and because of the cycle of abuse that I went through at home, he was very easy at manipulating me. Thinking back on it now, I should have beat the ever-living crap out of him when I had the chance. So, what does this have to do with the incident that I had went through? Simple. I had finally stood up for myself after having a relatively bad day. After being guilt-tripped for the 700,000th time by my parent on the phone for not working fast enough in my classes, Deke decided that it would be a great idea to start guilt-tripping me again for no apparent reason when I got back to my room. Well, all of that anger and rage and abuse that I went through, well, that all came to a head, and I snapped hard. While I didn't, ki I didn't cause any kind of physical harm to him, even though I should have, I did give him a heavy piece of my mind in a very colorful manner. When I was done with that, needless to say, that didn't go well. In fact, other than a few sniffles coming from his nose, Deke looked absolutely unfazed by what I had just said. However, his eyes said something very di different. I didn't get much of an opportunity to read them that well, because he simply walked out of my our dorm without another word. Later that night, he would he would wind up coming back. I had already been asleep at the time after having worked on an assignment for class that was due the very next day. Basically, it was a full rendering of a small 11-minute animated plot that I was working on for class. Percent of my grade, and if I didn't pass it, then I'd have to either rate take the class again, and thus, or I'd have to quit whatever it is that I do, leave college, and then go back to my parents. And that wasn't an option for me. Well, when I woke up the next day and got ready for class, I saw Deke staring at me from across the room on his bed. He looked like he hadn't slept at all that night, but honestly, I really didn't care. I got my things ready for class and then handed my USB drive with the episode that I'd been working on before class, before class started, to my professor. Now, my professor had originally planned on having an open project viewing during the class as well as a presentation, but due to a few complications with some of the equipment, including the projector in the classroom, he told us that he was going to be, well, viewing every single one of our um, animation projects personally after class, and then would hand us our grade the very next day. This was a huge relief to me, as I was a very antisocial person, and still am, and I wasn't really wanting to get up in front of the entirety of the hundred plus people that were in my classroom at that point and present my project to everybody without having a breakdown. Once the day had finally concluded, I was pretty much free for the entire weekend. I didn't have any classes that I had to deal with, thank goodness, and I had been planning on having a nice relaxing couple of days for myself. However, all those plans were completely and utterly dashed when I opened up my dorm room door, only to find a printed letter from the dean that was quite literally right next to my desk to sit there and come to his office as soon as I possibly could. I had already felt a pit in my stomach when I had read that note the first time around, but only tightened up even more, even more when I made my way over towards the dean's office. Upon arriving, I was told to sit down in one of the seats. What happened next was something that I can't really explain, as my mind kind of went blank during the duration of the visit, but if I can recall anything, it was basically the dean yelling at me for something that I wound up sending in as a project of some sort, and that it had caused one of, the, my, one of my professors to quit, and that I was going to be expelled for the supposed messed up imagery that I had dared taint the school with. Yeah, I didn't really... It didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me then, and even now, I still question what in the world he even meant by that last phrase. The last thing that wound up happening in that office before being sent back into my dorm room was being sworn at by the dean and angrily told to, quote, get the hell out of my office, unquote. He used some pretty messed up language, but for the sake of this post, I'm not going to put what he said there. Honestly, when I was making my way back to my dorm, I really had no idea or even clue as to what he was even talking about. I mean, what is it that I had done to deserve a th the threat of expulsion? My question was quickly answered when I walked into my dorm room. 
only to find my small green USB drive that I had copied my project on right next to my laptop. I even popped into my computer and lo and behold, my project was right there. But that led me to another major question. If my USB drive was still in my dorm, then what the heck was it that I had handed over to my professor? I started a search around my computer for any kind of answers to the questions that I may have honestly had, but no matter what I did, I couldn't really find anything. Then again though, my computer was filled with various junk apps and the like that I had downloaded onto it months back, so it only seems fair that I wouldn't be able to really find anything, at least not without having a heavy search going through my computer, which was what I wound up doing for the next four and a half hours. I looked through every single file that I had on my computer for any kind of explanation. Video files, music files, documents, .zip files, programs, even my animation software that I had. No answers. I was stuck in a rut for a good long while before I was called into the Dean's office again. This time, he was even more ticked off than when I had seen him last time. He basically went off on me about talking of that... about. He basically went off on me, talking and apparently saying that I had a messed up video that I had supposedly created and uploaded it to the school's main webpage. Confused, I asked him if I could see what he was talking about, to which he immediately pulled out his laptop, got on the school's website, and then proceeded to load up a video for me to watch. Once the video had finished buffering, the video began with something that I wasn't even remotely expecting to see that day. The Max and Ruby theme song and all its 2D glory blaring out of the double speakers in the Dean's laptop. To say that I was surprised would be an understatement. In fact, I was actually close to falling to the ground in laughter at what I was looking at. However, given the expression that was solidified on the Dean's face, I wasn't willing to inadvertently admit supposed guilt by laughing. Once the intro had concluded, the scene then cut out to show the startup of the episode, with Ruby, Max, their grandmother, Luis, and the rest of the Bunny Scout troop standing near a bus stop. Ruby, Luis, and the other Bunny Scouts were all wearing their uniforms, and all bore giddy looks on their faces. Oh, Grandma, this is going to be an exciting weekend, Ruby began. I can't wait to earn my camping merit badge. Ruby's grandmother chuckled a bit before saying, I bet you can't wait either, Ruby. I'm sure that with your talent and skills, you'll be the first to get that badge. Thank you, Grandma, Ruby said, giving her grandmother a hug. Oh, you're quite welcome, Ruby, dear, the grandmother said, patting Ruby on the head. Ruby then let go of her grandmother and then turned over towards Max, who looked a little bit upset, likely because of the fact that Ruby was going to be gone for the weekend at camp. Ruby, seeing the saddened expression on Max's face, walked up to him and knelt down to meet him eye-level and said, You don't need to worry, Max, Ruby began. I promise you that I'll be safe and sound during my camping trip. Mrs. Huffington is going to supervise the trip and make sure that we don't have any problems and that we're all okay. Max ex Max Max's expression didn't, well, break his worried look. Ruby saw this and said, Hey, Max. I have an important job for you to do while I'm away, Ruby said, which immediately caught Max's attention. I need you to watch over my dolls when I'm away, okay? If you do a good job, I'll bake you the mud cake you, I'll, I'll bake you a nice mud cake that you like to have. Max's expression immediately brightened up at that phrase, and soon he began to nod his head in agreement. After he did that, the bus immediately pulled into the bus stop. The door to the bus opened up, revealing Mrs. Huffington, dressed in full scout gear, with the clipboard making her way down the stairs of the bus. Bunny Scouts? Mrs. Huffington called out. Yes, Assistant Buddy Scout Leader? All of the bunnies called out in unison. I'm so glad you all are here today. The campgrounds have been prepared for us and this weekend, so come on up and hand in your permission slips, please, Mrs. Huffington called out. One by one, each of the Bunny Scouts made their way towards the bus and began to hand in their permission slips in the process. While this went on, the scene then cut over to show Ruby giving her brother and her grandmother a big hug before proceeding to say goodbye and make her way over towards the bus. Once she handed in her permission slip, she climbed onto the bus and then made her way over towards her best friend Luis and sat down next to her. 
The bus then turned on and began to drive away from the bus stop. As it slowly did, Ruby looked out of the window one last time and proceeded to wave goodbye to her brother and grandmother. The scene then transitioned over to show the bus making its way down an empty street. As it did so, the scene would cut to show the interior of the bus, showing everybody talking quietly to one another. Oh boy, Luis, this is going to be so much fun, Ruby said excitedly. You bet it is, Ruby. I can't wait to get that badge, Luis responded. The camera then cut back to show Mrs. Huffington carefully standing up on the bus, and when she managed to catch her balance properly, she spoke. Okay, everyone. Before we get to the campsite, I've written down one of every one of your names and paired you up with a bunny buddy. You and your bunny buddy are going to be working together during the camping trip, Mrs. Huffington said, to which all the bunnies there began to cheer. Mrs. Huffington then motioned for everyone to be quiet, while they all, which they all did immediately. Once there was silence again, Mrs. Huffington continued her announcement. Anyway, once we get off the bus, I'll be handing you all a small envelope to each of you, naming which one of you will be buddying up with who. Remember one thing though, children. Whatever you do, do not let your bunny buddy out of your sight. The woods surrounding the camp area is very dense, and many bunnies have gotten lost in those woods too many times. Mrs. Huffington's voice, once cheery voice and took on a s slightly serious one rather quickly. So I ask you all to please be safe. Keep your buddy in check and make sure of it that you lock your cabin doors each night, you hear? The scene then quickly cut to Ruby, who now bore a rather puzzled expression on her face. She immediately raised her hand. Yes, Ruby? Mrs. Huffington called out. Um, Assistant Scout Master? Ruby began. I thought we were going to set up tents to sleep in. The camera then cut back to Mrs. Huffington, who answered, saying, Well, normally for a camping trip like this one, we would. However, given the dense nature of the forest and how easy it is to get lost in there, the bunnies that run the camp there have insisted that we instead use the cabins provided at the campgrounds, Mrs. Huffington said before her tone went back to her joyful one. Besides, my little bunnies... We all still get to enjoy our camping activities, and there's even a cafeteria not too far away from the campsite for us to eat during our trip. Also, it's really hot in the woods this time of year, and I'm sure that you all don't want to get eaten up by, my, by mosquitoes and other bugs, do you? Mrs. Huffington asked. The others simply nodded their heads no before Mrs. Huffington said her last line in the scene and sat back down in her seat. Good. The scene then cut back to show Ruby and Louise sitting there. A little bit surprised. Huh. Well, I guess we get to bunk in a cabin together, Louise said rather awkwardly. Yeah, I guess so. Kind of takes away a little bit of the camping experience, but as long as we get to have some fun and earn our badges, I don't see there being an issue, Ruby said. Still there, Ruby. Why is it that we have to lock our doors at night? I highly doubt that either of us will walk outside. I mean, unless we're sleepwalkers, that is, Louise said. Yeah, good point, but maybe it's just there to make sure of it that, well, like you said, none of us sleeps walk into the forest, Ruby chuckled. Louise chuckled as well and then said, <laughs> Well, knowing how some of these girls are here, it's a possibility. The scene then cut to the outside of the bus, driving down a long road ahead of them, before immediately transitioning over to show the bus parked next to a large, lush field of, field of grass with about six or seven cabins assigned, aligned in a semicircle next to a large lake near it. At the very center of it was a large fire pit surrounded by logs of various sizes and shapes, likely for sitting on. All of the bunnies, including the assistant bunny scout leader, Mrs. Huffington, were all lined up outside of the bus, envelopes in hand. The camera quickly panned to where all the scouts were at. Okay, everyone, open up your envelopes, please. Mrs. Huffing Mrs. Huffington ordered. All of the bunnies there opened up the envelopes in unison, the scene cutting to show Ruby's envelope opening up first. The paper that was in it had the name Luis written down on it, with a number right next to it. The camera then cut out to show Ruby's excited face before Luis walked up towards Ruby, paper in hand, and said, Hey Ruby, guess who's my bunny buddy? Luis asked. Let me guess. It's me, Ruby said in a sarcastic way. You bet it is, Louise answered. Ruby simply smirked at her best friend. Well, Louise, guess who gets to be my bunny buddy? Ruby asked. Who? 
Louise asked. Me, Ruby said in a sly way before her and Louise laughed together. The scene then panned over to Mrs. Huffington, who stood at the middle of the fire pit before pulling out a small whistle and blowing on it, catching everybody's attention in the process. One by one, all of the bunny scouts there made their way over towards the assistant bunny scout leader. Okay, my little bunnies, Mrs. Huffington called out. You and your bunny buddy go on ahead and make your way over to your cabin and unpack. I'll make sure to sound the bell for dinner, Mrs. Huffington said, before dismissing the rest of the scouts to their respective cabins. Ruby and Luis began making their way over towards one of the smaller cabins in the circles, around the fire pit, and then walked in. The scene then cut to show the main interior of the cabin, which really wasn't much except a pair of beds with sheets, blankets, pillows, and a single window looking out of the forest at the back, a, a door that led to a bathroom, and lastly, a few dressers right next to the beds, with a, with a small lamp right in the middle. Luis and Ruby then walked over towards their beds, Ruby's being the one closest to the window, and began unpacking. So, Ruby... What do you want to do once we get done unpacking? Louise asked as she continued to unpack her things. Well, seeing as how the lake is just a walk away from the cabins, I think we should probably go swimming for a little bit before dinner. Ruby said, Ooh, that sounds like fun. I'm going to finish up pretty... Uh, well, let's both finish up quickly so that we can get in the water. Louise said before grabbing her swimsuit and walking into the bathroom. The scene then transitioned to show both Ruby and Louise making their way over towards where the lake was which was actually a pretty far walk, judging from the view of the background. As they walked, Luis noticed a path leading into the woods. It was rather narrow, but it looked as though like just two people could go through it. Maybe not side by side, but definitely front to back. Hey, Ruby, Luis said, stopping at the edge of the trail, to which Ruby stopped walking and turned to her. Uh, what's up, Luis? Ruby asked. I found this trail. Maybe it might be a shortcut to the lake, Louise answered. I don't know, Louise. The path that we're on isn't too far away from the lake. I doubt that that's a shortcut, Ruby answered, sounding a little bit hesitant. Oh, come on, Ruby. It's not like we're going to get lost in there. And besides, don't you want to go and explore? Louise answered. I don't know, Ruby answered. I'm sure it's fine, Ruby. Besides, isn't exploring the whole reason to go camping anyway? Louise said. Okay, you've got a good point there, Ruby said. And regardless, we're bunny buddies. And what, And the rules are, you can't leave your bunny bunny behind, Louise said as she began to walk down the pathway, to which Ruby simply snorted a little bit and then followed suit. The two rabbits then started making their way down the path, admiring the various plants and trees in the area even stopping at one point to eat a few fresh blueberries from one of the bushes. This went on for a good few minutes of the episode before the camera panned over to Ruby, who was busy enjoying the walk. Oh, Louise, this was such a great time, but I think it's time for us to get back to the camp, don't you think? Ruby said before her face froze. The scene panned out to show Ruby, completely alone in the woods. Louise was nowhere to be seen. Louise? Luis, where are you? Ruby said, nearly on the verge of a panic attack. There was no response. Luis, w where are you? Th this isn't funny! Ruby yelled out. Just as Ruby was about to lose her mind, Luis popped up behind her and covered her eyes and said, I'm right here, Ruby. I never left. Ruby immediately spun over towards her friend with a bit of panic in her voice. Luis, why did you do that? I, I thought you left me, Ruby scolded. Louise simply giggled at that statement and then began leading Ruby and herself out of the wooded area. You know I would never leave you here on purpose. I just wanted to play a little camp prank on you, that's all, Louise said with another chuckle. Ruby simply rolled her eyes and said nothing until the two made their way out of the path. However, once they did, the two bunnies began to make their way over towards the path that led to the pond. Unfortunately, though, after a few steps in their direction, the sound of a bell sounded. Aw, man, Ruby said. Well, I guess it's time to go and get dinner. Sorry about that, Ruby, Louise said with a frown on her face. Eh, it's alright. Besides, we got three full days to go swimming and enjoy ourselves, 
Ruby said, grabbing Luis by the paw and quickly running back to the cabins to go and change and then go get dinner. The scene then transitioned over to show the interior of the camp cafeteria, but we're panning over to Ruby and Luis sitting down at one of the tables, eating a few hot dogs and fries. Wow, for camp food, this is actually pretty delicious, Ruby said. Yeah, it's pretty tasty and all, but it stinks they didn't have any dessert today, Luis answered before finishing off her second hot dog. Well, when we get back home, I'll make sure of it to make an awesome cake to celebrate the two of us getting our merit badges. Does that sound good? Ruby said. Yeah, that sounds really good, Luis answered. As the two finished off the rest of their meals, there was a sound of another bell that caught everyone's attention. Everybody looked over at where the sound of the bell had came from, to which the scene quickly panned over to show Mrs. Huffington standing at a stage of some sort. All right, everyone. I hope you all had a great day today, because tomorrow is going to be even better, Mrs. Huffington said, which caused all the other Bunny Scouts to cheer as well. Now with that said, I do have a few announcements to make. My first announcement is that once everybody is finished eating, you and your Bunny Buddy need to go to your cabins and lock your doors tightly. A few of the staff here will come and check on your doors to see if you're locked in or not. If you don't do this, you'll both get a demerit. Everyone in the room gasped a bit when she had mentioned the word demerit. Second announcement. There will be schedules posted on your door after the morning wake-up bell. Please make sure of it that you and your bunny buddy hold on to this and keep it, or at least keep it in a pocket of some sort, so that you know what's needed to do next for the day. It will change as the days keep going. And lastly, do not any, do not, under any circumstance, leave the campsite. Mrs. Huffington's tone became much more stricter when she mentioned the last announcement. Her face definitely showed that she wasn't joking either. Any bunny in this, any bunny in this camp that either leaves the campgrounds from the entrance to the river will be given three demerits. Your bunny scout membership will be revoked, and you'll be taken home with a letter home. And for the bunny buddy that's responsible for you, they'll be demoted three ranks if not completely expelled from the group either. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This also includes a small trail in the camp that breaks away from the path to the river. These rules will be heavily enforced. Do you all understand this? Mrs. Huffington said. Everybody there immediately answered with, Yes, Assistant Bunny Scout Leader, in unison. At this, Mrs. Huffington's expression went back to the soft, happy expression as she clamped her paws together and said, Splendid. I'm glad to hear that. Now, my fellow little bunny scouts, enjoy the rest of your meals, and I wish you all a good long night. Mrs. Huffington then proceeded to walk off the stage and back over towards a separate table to finish the rest of her dinner. And with that, the scene transitioned to show Ruby and Luis in their cabin, getting ready for bed. As they do this, Luis immediately got up from where she was lying at and began checking to see if the door was properly locked. Luis, you know you've checked that lock about six times so far. You don't need to keep checking it all the time, Ruby said, looking away from a book that she was reading. I know, Ruby. It's just that I really want to make sure of it that we both don't get in any kind of trouble for on our first day, Luis answered. Ruby simply rolled her eyes once more and then went back to reading her book. Luis, after checking the lock once more, carefully made her way back into her bed and lied down in it. Hey, Ruby, Luis asked aloud. Ruby turned away from her book again and asked, Yes, Luis? I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever seen Miss Huffington get that serious before, Luis said, cringing a little bit at the thought. Now that you mentioned it, Ruby began, that was a little bit out of character for Mrs. Huffington. I mean, she could have said that in a different way, but... It seemed like she acted kind of scared. Well, scared might be a bit of an overstatement, Ruby. But I do agree that it is rather odd that she reacted that way at dinner. Luis answered. Actually, didn't you... Didn't she act odd during our ride to the camp as well? Ruby asked. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, she did sound a little bit serious when she said, you know, that we had to sit there and lock our doors, but nothing that noticeable. Why do you ask? Well, it's nothing. Although it's a good idea that we both know 
<laughs> Although it's definitely a good thing that we both know not to ever go down that path that we went to today. Ruby said with a slightly nervous chuckle. Yeah, that's true. Who knows how much trouble we, we, we would have gotten in if we were caught, Louise answered. Still though, I wonder why Mrs. Huffington was acting the way that she did, Ruby wondered. Well, maybe it's because of how dense the forest is, maybe? Or supposedly the fact that bunnies have gone missing? Or maybe she's just worried that we might get lost in the woods if we're not careful enough. I mean, she is our assistant bunny scout leader, that is. And she's responsible for every single one of us, so it only seems necessary that she be a little bit on edge, you know, during this trip, Louise said. You've got a good point there, Louise. Still, it's just... Ruby's sentence was immediately interrupted by the sound of a male voice calling out from the two, saying, Lights out, everybody. See you all at breakfast. The two buddies jumped a little bit at that sudden statement that came, but calmed down enough to answer with a good night as well before turning the lights out and snuggling up in their beds. The scene then slowly transitioned to black for a few moments, but we're transitioning back to show the inside of the cabin of Ruby and Luis in the middle of the night. Ruby winds up stirring awake during one part of it, and then groans before getting up and making her way over towards the restroom. However, just as she's about to open up the bathroom door and go inside, she looked over at the back window and immediately froze her eyes filling with fear. The camera then cut to show the window, with a blackened silhouette of an older bunny staring behind the window down at Ruby. It doesn't really do much of anything, but instead just stands there for a bit, before slowly moving away from the window slowly. The camera then cut back to Ruby, whose eyes are still retaining that look of horror. Then, in almost an instant, she falls to the floor and passes out, just like that. The scene then transitions once more to show Ruby in her bed waking up with a jump. This in turn woke up Louise, who turned to Ruby, saying, Are, are you alright, Ruby? Louise asked. Ruby didn't answer that question, but instead got up from bed and began making her way over towards the bathroom to freshen up. The scene then cut to show both Ruby and Louise eating breakfast, but Ruby looked rather unresponsive, for, at least for the most part. No matter what they either did or, or anything, she didn't really break away from that look. Now, I think it's important to interrupt this by saying what wound up happening next. You see, as I was watching the footage, obviously very intrigued by it, the Dean immediately slammed his laptop shut from view and then immediately looked at me for a few moments. Now, for some odd reason, he didn't look angry anymore, but instead he looked more curious. He then proceeded to ask me a few questions about the episode and why I looked the way that I did. Apparently, in his own words, he, quote, could read the innocence that was on my face, which to him apparently said that I wasn't guilty of making that episode. He then asked me if I happened to know anybody that may have had a problem with me in the past, and I instantly told him about my roommate who was a complete and utter nutjob, Deke. This seemed to click relatively quickly in the Dean's brain, and almost immediately he profusely apologized to me for wasting my time and then proceeded to send me back to my room without any remote kind of consequences or anything like such. I honestly don't know much else would happen during, during the rest of the day after seeing that footage that I had seen with the Dean, but... Judging by the fact that my roommate never came to class on Monday, or the fact that on that specific day, most of, her, most of his stuff was out of our shared room door as well, basically told me what happened to Deke. Honestly, as much as this might sound a little bit, well, mean, I honestly couldn't be happier that he was out of my life. As for the rest of the footage, this is the thing. I never really got much of the opportunity to watch the rest of it. There were actually a few reasons to this. For one, my roommate apparently had gotten charged with vandalism of school property and posting obscene material online on their site, which kind of goes into the whole vandalism thing, but it's being considered as a separate charge, and a bunch of other ones that I was never really told what happened. And because of this, the episode that was on, well, that drive was taken in from the was taken into the police's evidence. And it's very likely that I'll never ever get that 
USB back, or anything like such. But on a more positive note, I thankfully did have a copy of my actual project on my laptop, and after the whole thing was explained, the professor was quickly rehired of his own volition, and I wound up turning in, and I wound up passing with a B+. I mean, it wasn't an A, but you know what? At least I passed. So at least something good did wind up coming out of this. Now, normally this is the part where I would normally end a post like this. But given the fact that I had already pretty much been left high and dry on what happened after that scene with Ruby and Luis getting breakfast and the weird face that Ruby was making, I think it was only appropriate that I at least give a small summary of what happened in the rest of the episode. Of course though, I had to really go around asking anybody on campus what they had seen on that website. And shockingly enough, very very few people had even seen saw what the episode was on the school's website that had been uploaded. And the few that did wind up watching watching it, most of them basically started spouting out a bunch of stupid bullcrap about Ruby getting killed by the spooky guy and sacrificed by Mr. My, by, by Mrs. Huffington, or Ruby becoming a spooky spirit or something like that. I mean, likely just to try and get some kind of reaction out of me. Which, of course, didn't work whatsoever. Although, technically speaking, thinking about how Deke was... It wouldn't be much of a surprise, but the way that that episode went out, just it just didn't seem likely. Now, I honestly was at one point not likely chance is not going to be able to get much of any information until I found this one person who was actually a younger freshman just starting up college, who was also working in the same animation industry that I was wanting to work for. Me and her actually wound up becoming good friends during her time in college. And I remember her, I remember asking her about what she had seen on that episode. This is what she told me. Once Ruby and Louise had finished up the rest of the day after that incident last night with the bunny silhouette figure and everything, Ruby started seeing the figure of the rabbit at the very corner of her eye, and which in turn gave her a bit of paranoia in that process. Luis had tried to help Ruby as much as possible, basically saying, you know, it doesn't exist, they're not real, or things of that nature that, you know, Ruby needs to go to bed early, but it didn't seem to really work, as Ruby started to see the figure more and more and more. And it got so bad that even, um, that even Luis herself wind up getting Miss, Miss Huffington involved. And while she herself looked like she had seen a ghost after Louisa described what Ruby was looking at and seeing, she assured, the she assured her and Ruby as well that everything was going by fine and that there was no problems going on. Well, that wasn't the case. And this was proven, by, uh, proven to be true during a campfire session in the woods during the around close to the time of the end of the episode, where apparently the figure had wind up showing itself to everyone there, completely out of the blue. And of course, as expected, panic wind up ensuing. I don't really remember too much else after that because I was pretty disturbed watching the thing and I think I skipped a good portion of the rest of it, but when I got to the ending, that was the one part that really stuck with me. And it will continue to stick with me until I leave this earth. And that was the final scene with Ruby's grandmother and little brother Max sitting down in their home in the living room with the television on. They both had worried expressions on their faces and Max was shaking a little bit. The news anchor bunny that was on the TV that was shown proceeded to talk about the camp and that there was no evidence or anything suggesting anything going on about the recent disappearances of all the bunny scouts that were there or were not there to begin with and that the only thing that they could genuinely find were a few of the belongings of the entire Bunny Scout group. The police were also in the process of trying to find any remote evidence and the possibility of any of the bunnies being found and being brought back home. The last scene of the episode before it ended was of Max whispering to himself his one and only line in the episode. Where are you, Ruby? Please... Please come home. Please. In fear and surprise as your eyes widen, your mouth goes dry with each battered breath. 
You try to scream, your mind begs to be glued to your computer screen. The killers, they slash, the tapes burn and crash. The cartridge you bought will be your final haunt. The rituals of hate will seal your fate. The tears you shed will be from a fear-gripping portrait nightmarish gore filled terrorizing hateful burning violent rage-inducing knives slashing blood splattering silent screams only time will tell if you will escape this online hell your horror filled obsessions will come with its own regressions your pathetic screams will not be heeded in any way because your nightmares will come at any day